Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back. Dr. Jaws here, and tonight we are covering the Green Lantern Shark. Uh, and it's gonna be a cool night. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to catch up on, actually. Uh, there's a lot of weird shark news uh, happening lately, so uh, we have to catch up on that. Um, but it's gonna be a cool vibe tonight. Uh, we're gonna go back to some science and uh, some science history uh, with this species. We've got a lot of cool older records uh, on this particular species. And uh, I've got, uh, I don't know how loud it is, but a Chrono Trigger in the background. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have ever played Chrono Trigger. I've never played it, but I've heard it's extremely famous, and uh, I do like the music, so I thought it would be kind of a cool vibe for tonight. Also got everything dark in the background, uh, since we are studying a deep water species famous for uh, lighting things up in the dark. So, what's up Quackers? Uh, Sir Douglas Bane, Howard, what's up guys? It's great to see you guys. Hope you had a great weekend. Um, it's funny, I don't know if anybody, uh, saw the Super Bowl or cares about the Super Bowl. Uh, I personally don't really, like, um, like, we, my girlfriend and I just watched the Puppy Bowl, to be honest, so, but, um, yeah, I heard it was a good game. Uh, trending this weekend, though, I don't know if you guys have heard, um, and, and let me know what you guys uh, did over the weekend, uh, I'd love to see in the comments as well, um, but... I don't know if you heard, did, has anyone heard of this insane story that unfortunately is trending on Google about this stingray in a North Carolina aquarium and how it is mysteriously pregnant and um, there's a lot of wild suspicion on as to how that happened. Has anybody heard this story? Which it's it's really sad that it's trending on Google because it's it's really horrible. Like Like, it's, yeah. Um, and for anyone, okay, so yeah, uh, for anyone who hasn't, I, I just saw your comment, Quackers, no, so, um, so this is horrible, and I, before I share the story, I just want to say this is all fake and just junk, um, but unfortunately, it's trending on Google, so, um, you know, just, it's, it's a stupid thing, but, um, there is, <laughs> um, there is an aquarium, and it's not, one of the North Carolina aquariums, as far as I know, like it's in North Carolina, but like the North Carolina system of aquariums, which is uh, Roanoke Island, Pinal Shores, and oh shoot, there's one more, and I forget what it is. Um, but it's a great system. Like the actual North Carolina aquariums are very good. They're very solid aquariums. But there's this other one uh, I've never heard of before, and uh, apparently a stingray in a tank with just a stingray and a shark, um, you know, got pregnant. And, you know, is giving birth to, you know, another stingray. And, you know, that honestly could be a case of parthenogenesis. Um, we, you know, you have parthenogenesis in nature. So parthenogenesis meaning essentially like, this is not the right term, but like virgin birth where um, there is no male influence. Uh, essentially the female clones itself. Um, and it usually, ha it, it's very rare, but it is something that happens in a single sex environment that um, if there's, in, in like if there's no mate choice, no no males, uh, and it's a single sex environment, it's something that can happen. It's been documented in sharks. It's been documented in I think reptiles, uh, lizards, uh, and it's uh, actually what was I gonna say? I was about to say it was in Jurassic Park, but it's not. Jurassic Park, the animals switch sex, so they didn't they did not have virgin birth. But anyway, point being, um, so the the tank was shared by a stingray and a shark, and the thing that is trending is this horrible theory that the shark impregnated the the stingray that it was the shark's doing and i was like oh my no no that's impossible that's insane it's horrible uh so i'm happy to see immediately some very prominent um science social media people like why sharks matter immediately said that's absolutely crazy that did not happen um, so David Schiffman was like, that did not happen. Um, Melissa, um, Christina Martez, uh, Mart uh, she, she was like, that did not happen at all. Please do not follow the story. So I just wanted to say at the top of the hour, uh, yeah, that's, that's just wrong. Um, and it's unfortunately, it's trending on like every major, at least every major American news outlet, which sucks. Um, because it's such a clickbaity, catchy article. Like, did a shark impregnate a stingray? And the reality is no. And, and it, it like, that's, it, it's, it's the best comparison would be like, it's like saying, it's the same thing as saying like, can a shrew impregnate a black bear? It's like, it's like, they're too, too far removed. Like, like to, to have any, any possible sense of that actually working. Um, 
we've talked about on a recent stream hybridization where um, hybrids which can only happen with two very closely related species like the black tip shark and the Australian black tip shark. These are in the same genus. These are super close together. Um, that's even risky. A lot of hybrids are just not successful. Um, like um, mules are a great example where it's like they, you know, you can successfully, what is a mule? It's like a cross of like a horse and a donkey. Um, but like the mule, it's the, 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 the resulting um, mule is sterile. It can't reproduce. Like, like hybrid, hybrids are not successful in the wild, like, uh, for, for the most part. They're just not successful. Um, it's, it's just too risky. There's usually something, like, even if the hybrid lives, it's genetically wrong. And that's with, that's with two very closely related species. A shark and a stingray are so far removed from each other, like, genetically, that it's just, it's not possible. So, um, it's a clickbaity article, it's, it's just been making the news. So I just wanted to kind of, like, clear that up and just say at the top of the hour, like, it's, it's impossible for a shark and a stingray to, I, I, I can't even say, like, me, because it's, like, it's just, it's, it's just insane. It, it's ridiculous. And I actually cracked up when I read, like, the, the actual species. It was, like, a, um... A bamboo shark which makes it even worse where it's like come on like there's no way so um i think what happened is that it's parthenogenesis i'm very suspicious of like this whole shark stingray thing as far as like where that came from and who said that and you know i feel like that's kind of irresponsible if the aquarium actually is the one that's claiming that um because a lot of the news a lot of news outlets are picking it up and running with it because it's just great clickbait and and you know it's like, it's like very catchy, but like it's it's just stupid you know at the end of the day. And I, I hate to be that blunt, but it's stupid. It's 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 just not possible in nature. So just want to say that I don't want to waste any more time on that. But I was curious if anybody saw that. So see some great comments. Uh, Howard, wow, excellent. So is it a shrey or a rark? I like a rark. <laughs> Oh, Hacker is a shrey. Oh, a shrey. I like that. Like that. Shrey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my oh my god. Oh my god. I'm into Lisa. Lisa, 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 you know what? I know why I started that, that because, that, because that's, 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 that's the greatest song of all. I, 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 I appreciate that a lot, that a lot actually. Thank you, thank you. Because, like, because, like, at least at that's the silver lining. Because it's, it's frustrating to see like articles like this. Um, and I will say, like, say, like. As charismatic as, as, as sharks, sharks are, are uh, um, I wonder, I wonder like, like if they, they unfortunately, unfortunately run into more, more misinformation, misinformation than other than groups of animals, animals in terms of like, like um, uh, it's like this stuff, uh, the megalodon stuff, um, like you know, great white serial killer stuff, like it's just yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if, if it's kind of funny. Like for the most part, I think it's very beneficial that sharks get as much attention as they do. But like, it's in, it's interesting to see this other side of it, where there's just still a lot of sensational articles and sensational stuff, and it's just like I don't know. Uh, that was that was just kind of that was just crazy stuff. So, um, but. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, hey, favorite hybrid in nature, animal nature is the Galapagos marine land iguana. Oh, I've never heard of that. I didn't realize that. So, like, it's a it's a hybrid between the marine iguana and then a a land iguana in the I I, I don't know that much about like the Galapagos uh, the terrestrial Galapagos system. So that's really cool. Very very cool. Um, let's see. Oh, no. Audio fuzzier than usual. Oh, oh, thank you. Audio good now. Sorry about that. Yeah, I hope it's not, like, the music, so... Um, but Sir Douglas Bain, yes, absolutely. Whatever the name is, it unfortunately cannot exist. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just too crazy. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, a shrew and a bear, or, like, a bat and a deer. It's, it's like that. It's, it's, it's even more genetically removed than that, but, yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, in interesting. Uh, sharks live in a mysterious environment, which creates conjecture. You know, like it's it's, yeah. I mean, because it's like when you think about I, what I'm kind of curious about is like what other groups of animals would you have such a like 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 I'm trying to think of other groups of animals with comparable misunderstandings. Because the only other group I could think of are like like dinosaurs. There's a lot of um, a lot of speculation about dinosaurs, and it makes sense because like. You know, they're extinct and everything, but, like... Oh, how I want a deer bat? A deer bat would be a frightening creature to behold. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, like... 
I feel like snakes get off pretty well, alligators get off pretty well, uh, big cats get off pretty well, like as far as accuracy goes. So I, um, let me know in the comments if there's a shark or, or if there's something that's like comparable to sharks as far as like kind of weird articles and sensationalism. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I can't think off the top of my head a, a group of animals that would be similar as far as just like clickbaity stuff, but it's very interesting. So. A fuzzy triceratops. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. It's funny. Um, like, I think recent renderings of T-Rex... I, I think there's a debate now. I, I, and forgive me, I'm not as familiar with um, paleontology, but like, as far as dinosaurs go. But like, um, I, 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 th I think the most recent rendering of T-Rex is lightly feathered. Um, so it actually had feathers, but I think that's under debate. Um, let, let me know if that's, if, like, because, like, raptors definitely had feathers. A lot of, like, the bird-like dinosaurs had feathers. But, like, um, T-Rex, I think there's an interesting debate about whether or not it actually had feathers. So, but point being, like, just groups of animals that you can kind of speculate stuff about. Um, I feel like sharks get a lot of speculation, unfortunately, and mythos for, for, for better and worse. So, but, anyway. So, tonight's species... <laughs> Um, I'll keep an eye on the comments. Tonight's species is going to be really cool uh, because I think this is a fun gateway in terms of science changing over time. So um, we've got some cool studies from the 50s, the 90s, uh, the, I guess, early 10s with um, the IUCN Red List, and then some modern research on shark bioluminescence. So uh, this is going to be really cool to check out um, in detail. So an Emopterus virans is one of the classic lantern sharks. I would say Emopterus princeps and Emopterus gristilla spinus. Um, I feel like they're kind of the classics. Uh, also, this could be biased uh, because these are all Atlantic species, um, but I feel like those three I see quite often, but it could be like region bias. So, um, but yeah, this one, this one is a really great, um, this is a great suggestion, um, and it's a really great, uh, shark to study as far as lantern sharks go. I think we'll have quite a bit of information to chew, chew over. Um, unfortunately, because lantern sharks are so small and so removed, um, it's hard to get footage of them, so, and, or at least on a species level. So, um, I pulled up some interesting little clips of lantern sharks, all at Mopterus. Um, they're not, they're not the same species, but it's a good approximation of maybe how they move and kind of the environment uh, in which they live. So we'll go over a couple of these clips tonight, which are really, they're really cool to see. And then we'll dive in to um, the uh, uh, research. So, but starting with uh, Inner Space Center, by the way, um, it, it, I always get confused because um, it's NOAA. I think the expedition or the ship is the Okeanos Explorer, but then the actual channel to watch these clips is the Inner Space Center. Um, but please definitely subscribe to this because it's just the coolest thing. Uh, if you ever want to like see some of the deep sea and um, also like if you ever want like a vibe as far as um, I think there are some longer videos of just some of their expeditions in the background. But they see some really cool stuff including this lantern shark. So this is the Northeast U.S. Canyons uh, expedition. Um, I wonder if it says really quick which canyon they went to. Um, cause like, I, I love underwater canyons. I always talk about Norfolk Canyon. That's the one, um, nearest to me. Hudson is the biggest one. It's recently becoming a marine sanctuary. Um, I don't see which canyon this is. So, um, okay. So we'll have to look that up later in terms of which expedition this was, but here we go. This is a lantern shark. That's actually a pretty sizable individual. Um, and we'll slow that down, um, cause it's probably, I think it's just a quick glimpse of the shark. This is, I forget the name of this kind of fish, but, um, I forget the name of that kind of fish cause I, I think it might be kind of like that ugly one that I don't really like. It's not Bazozetus. It's the, um, it's the deep sea li lizard fish, but I don't think it's that one. So, um, as far as this video, uh, most of it is going to be this lobster pot pile, and it's only that one clip of the shark. So I'm just kind of scrub through to see if the shark pops up again, but I don't think it does. So we'll we'll just kind of go back and slow down just to get some observations on the shark itself. But um, it's still really cool to see it. It's also quite eerie to see like a pile of lobster pots this far down. 
um, and something that kind of provides structure and hiding places for a lot of um, marine organisms. So, but here is our. I'm going to slow that down. Here is our lantern shark. And I really, I, I, um, I really like that comment that it looks like a mini submarine, um, which I, I think is actually quite accurate as far as like it's it's dorsal fins are very low, uh, very cylindrical body, uh, nice uniform gray color. But of course, uh, lantern sharks they do light up. They have bioluminescent bellies um, that glow uh, this beautiful blue uh, color, and we'll see a little bit of that um, later today. It's kind of funny for uh, this kind of animal, slow moving. Um, the caudal fin is actually fairly large. So we'll move on to a new clip in a second, but it's a nice view of um, just this shark being pretty close to the seabed, probably just cruising for um, easy to grab prey, conserving its energy down in the cold deep. This is, here we go. That stream, this, this is kind of an interesting video. Um, that's a really great photo of the lantern shark. Um, this is from a channel called Sea Discovery. Um, I just want to point out that clip right here, if you see that streak of blue, um, that is probably plankton, um, bioluminescent plankton. Um, I was about to say, like in, in, in this part of the world, um, in the Chesapeake Bay, we have tinafores or comb jellies um, that also grow uh, glow bright blue. Um, but uh, when the water moves and when, like as far as like plankton goes, uh, I think one of the like fam most famous places is the Bio Bay, I think it's called in Puerto Rico. Um, but anyway, when the water moves, like a wave is crashing, it's creating pressure that sets off these plankton. And so the plankton explode this nice bright blue. So I just want to point that out. This is at the very beginning of this particular video. Um, and they're just illustrating what bioillumination or uh, look, looks like in the ocean. And there's a similar phenomenon with lantern sharks um, as far as they produce this bright blue light. Um, in my part of the world of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, we have those um, glow-in-the-dark uh, comb jellyfish that if you touch them, like if you you know, haul up a fishing net, you'll see this bright blue color, uh, which is really cool. It's, it seems like something very exotic, but um, it's 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 actually you know here. And it's not just in the bay. I mean, anywhere on like the U.S. Atlantic, you're you'll see that kind of tina for that kind of comb jellyfish, and um, it will glow that bright blue um, at night, which is really cool. It's it's just like this magical thing, you know. Um, and I feel like I, I, I like I like talking about kind of the Mid Atlantic. Um, the United States Mid-Atlantic, because it's not it's not an area known for its sea life, but there's a lot going on here, and I, I like bringing more attention to it. So, But these are some great shots, and we'll, we'll rewind to fully appreciate them, but these are some great shots of lantern sharks, which again, they're a hard species to film because they live so far down, and they're so small. Um, some of them may arguably, ooh, that's a good shot of a chimera, or ratfish, so yeah, we definitely got to slow this down because this, this particular clip is packed full of um, photos and videos. Um, this is actually a really good photo illustrating um, the dark patch, um, which is related to the bioluminescence on this particular shark's body. Uh, so this gray, the gray back does not illuminate, but the dark um, bioluminescent patch, um, these are where a lot of the photophores or light producing organs are concentrated. So. These are just random, random clips of lantern sharks, both in the wild and unfortunately um, hauled up. Oh, these are, look at that. So I'm assuming this, this might be from like a research thing because this is, um, these are baby lantern sharks uh, that are still alive. Lots of cool photos of this um, group. So, Amopteridae is the family. Amopterus is uh, the main genus of lantern sharks. There's quite a few species. Like, I want to say at least 10, probably more, maybe even 20. Um, there's quite a few of them.
but they're very cute. And one thing I'm noticing in this particular shot, which is really cool, let's go back. Um, the back is actually a little iridescent. There's a little bit of iridescence going on. It's actually this like really pretty purple um, iridescence, uh, which I, I find really cool because those same tinafores I was talking about, like the same jellyfish or comb jellies, like they're also iridescent in the daytime. They're bioluminescent at night and iridescent in daytime. Um, and it's kind of cool. I didn't, I knew that lantern sharks were bioluminescent, but I didn't realize that they may have also like this iridescent quality to their skin. So, um, but you can actually see that in this clip a little bit, just this nice purpley, um, sheen right here. Very pretty. It's a different kind of beauty. Um, you know, it's a deep water shark. It's not colorful in the sense that like, you know, it's not these bold patterns, but then when you look closely, um, again, this, speech, this this group of sharks lights up, so they'll glow bright blue on the bottom. On the bottom, but then you also have this like really beautiful purple metallic sheen, uh, actually. Uh, also, kind of like a coppery gray back. It's really cool. It's actually a beautiful color palette. It's a little bit subtler, but um, it's very pretty. Um, this is a cool clip of a more active uh, lantern shark. Uh, look at these turns. Definitely hunting. That's actually a really great... Sorry. Oh, oh I don't know. I want to go back. That was a really great shot of um, it actually biting something. Back speed. So I slowed this down, but I love how it's like immediately arching, like like curling his back, takes a bite. So cool. Um, and compared to that first clip, you can see this one is much more active. It's not patrolling calmly in a straight line, doing a lot of sharp turns. Um, and a pretty busy, uh, like very highly active time. You see all these like shrimp uh, bouncing around everywhere. Uh, I'm assuming there's probably copepods in that frame too. Very cool. One more time, just take, uh, checking out that clip because it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool clip. Uh, I feel like it's hard to get on f on film lantern sharks hunting, but um, this is really cool to see. Yeah, I love these sharp turns. These complete one eighties. Um, I feel like in that particular shot, um, the eyes kind of came into the head a little bit or retracted into the head a little bit. We'll have to we'll have to look at that one more time. Uh, which would make sense if that's what's going on as far as like protecting the eyes as the shark takes a bite. A lot of shark species do that. So cool. This one, this one is very, very active. All right. One more time and I promise we'll move on. But look at its eyes, especially when it comes up to the top of the frame. Just keep an eye out on it or keep an eye on its eyes. Hello. Yeah, I think I think it's actually doing something. I think it's like retracting them in. Um, it does not have nictitating membranes. Um, only carcharinoforms have that. But it, I think it might be retracting the eyes in. Um, you know, like kind of like to protect them. Because a lot of um, other other deep water species, they do that. Um, we saw a really cool clip of a six gill shark the other day, or the other like a couple weeks ago. Um, and it's really eerie, like, how far back, um, it rolled its eyes into its head, so. Just another clip of this guy. Beautiful iridescence. That is really cool, actually. I'm kind of shining a light on the species, and you see, like, kind of towards the flank, that iridescent, yeah, look at that. It's almost like in this amethyst color. It's so cool. That is so cool. I wonder, um, as we read uh, bioluminescent papers later, oh, and I do want to pause this. No, I don't want to do that. Shoot. Keep pushing the wrong button. Um, I do want to pause this because there was a chimera very quickly in that clip. And I think everybody probably knows at this point, like what chimeras are, but um, it's a distant cousin of sharks and rays. Um, just in case as a refresher, uh, it's a very 
weird group of animals um, right here, this guy. Very, very spooky looking. Um, they're sometimes called ratfish or uh, ghost sharks, uh, but they are a cousin to sharks and rays. Um, they are not elasobranchs, but they are cousin, but they are cartilaginous fish. Um, they have a couple unique features, uh, including they have kind of like a um, a gill covering, like bony fish, which is a little weird. Um, they do have. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, their sexual organs are actually at their head, which is really weird. Um, they're odd. They're very odd looking, but they're definitely cartilaginous fish. A very cool group of animals that probably deserve a lot more attention than they get. So just wanted to point that out. It's a pretty cool thing. So uh, I'm going to catch up on the comments before we take a look at some more more stuff. So, Oh, yeah. Gas from release when this other babies move. Yeah, I think I think that might have been kind of like a scientific troll. Um I uh, love that, Sir Douglas uh, Bane. The brightest day in the darkest night. Yes. <laughs> oh, Quackers. I, I saw a clip recently of a great white rolling its eyes back. It was really cool. Yeah, that's actually, that's awesome. Because that's exactly, uh, that that's how a great white protects its eyes. Um, you know, and I know it's like infamous in like the movie Jaws, where it's like, uh, you know, the eyes roll back and you just see white. But it's like, and I think like in the movie, it's presented as this, this like weird, primal thing and i don't know if the book that peter eventually wrote that was like a thing like that but in nature um it's a way for the, the shark to protect protect its eyes and actually great whites have beautiful eyes um they look dark from afar but if you somehow get a chance to look at them very closely <laughs> like and safely uh, they have a beautiful blue iris um it's very it's pretty set in it's very deep but um if you can catch the angle of the light just right um they actually have um a bright blue iris so ooh, howard yes the holocephaly uh or holocephaly -li -li, related to enormous ancestors like edestus awesome awesome All, also helicoprion and stenacanthus two very famous um prehistoric uh shark relatives so that's that's super cool that elazarinks kind of carry on that heritage it's awesome awesome so Yes, uh, Minjus, maybe it does something like a frog or retracts eyes as a way to help trap push prey in the stomach. Um, that's a good... I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Like, um, I don't know if that would work as far as a digestive strategy, uh, as far as sharks go. But um, but I do think, like, the mechanism of, like, kind of like... Like, I think a frog is a good comparison as far as, like, the mechanism goes, as far as, like, having the eyes more flush with the body as a way to protect them. So it's probably not for the same purpose as like the frog does it, but I think physically it's a cool, it's a cool observation uh, and a cool parallel because I think it is a similar thing going on. So very cool. So, Oh, Sir Douglas, I've heard a lot, a lot of deep sea creatures can't see red light. Yes, that is true. Uh, what's really cool about that is um, red light is, so as light penetrates the ocean, um, like white light has all the wavelengths and then as it hits seawater it breaks into the different color lengths like red red light orange yellow green blue and violet um and red is the first to disappear as far as like red can only go down about 10 meters and then it can't go deeper and that's part of that's part of why um a lot of deep sea animals can't see anything that's red because red is just not a color that exists um deep 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 down like like blue light still exists relatively in the twilight zone a little bit um you know orange light green light they have or sorry yellow light and green light they can go further down um i think 50 meters is how far yellow light can go down but red light is the first to be filtered out so um that's part of why red light is a good camouflage method for a lot of deep sea creatures and it's part of why a lot of deep sea creatures are red um is because red is basically like like red is the new black, <laughs> like as far as like it's 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 just as effective um, in terms of being in the in the dark environment, because red light just gets filtered out so quickly. It it can only go down about ten meters um, in clear water. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really cool comment because um, I I always think it's so fascinating to see like how light plays with the ocean and um, it's part of why the ocean is blue uh, because like the warmer colors get filtered out and like the deeper like blue is the furthest penetrating light. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So, oh, uh, Sir Douglas Payne, anvil shark. 
Anvil Shark. Um, oh, uh, let's see. I forget what exactly an Anvil Shark is. I want to look that up in a second. But um, maybe DC fish that use red light migrated down but start the red light higher up. Interesting. Oh, Quackers. I love this comment, too. Uh, it's so weird and cool like how this somehow they somehow evolved to be red without ever really knowing what red is. So this is really cool. This is exactly what makes evolution awesome as far as um, it's it plays out on such a long time scale that like, you know, an individual animal in its lifetime is not it will never consciously know what is successful and what is not per se. But like um, it's hard to explain because it just plays out on such a large time scale. But like, you know, the things that are most successful will survive as far as like it is a successful adaptation to have to have red pigmentation as opposed to like green pigmentation for a deep sea organism and so the ones that have green and pigmentation were more likely to be wiped out like more likely to be like eaten because they were easier to see whereas the ones that were red pigmentation are more likely to survive because it is you know more camouflaged and so as time goes on, you get proportionally more and more and more and more red p pigmented organisms. And then the green pigmented organisms get filtered out because they get predated more. And so over time, red evolves as like the best color. It's the most successful color. Um, so which is really cool. Um, you know, I, the, the other example I can think of is, um, oh gosh, there's a very famous case of like, um, it's a moth that was in Britain that I think during the industrial revolution so much smoke and soot was um, produced in the air that it covered a, you know like tree bark in like an ashy gray color and there's a moth that had all these different varieties of like there's an ashy gray version a white version and a black version and birds could see the white and the black version better than the ashy gray version so the birds would eat the white and black version and they'll miss out on the ashy gray version. And so the ashy gray moth lives to reproduce and lives to like um, produce more ashy gray moths. And eventually that becomes the most successful phenotype is this ashy gray color. You know, it doesn't mean that like ashy gray or black or white is arbitrarily better. It just means that like in that moment of time in the industrial revolution, like ashy gray was the win it was the most fit to survive in, in, in that particular challenge or in that particular environment, uh, which is really cool. I, I think it's a great like case study for like kind of how natural selection works and like how evolution works. And then it relates to the whole red light and red pigmentation as far as animals go, um, like deep sea animals go. So it's it's really cool. Uh, it's it, and it's it's understandably it's really hard to explain evolution as far because the time scale is just so huge. Um, and it's like you know, for like high school biology, even it's, 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 it's not an easy concept, you know, to be fair. Um, but like, um, you know, that was, it was just a really cool question. Sorry. Sorry. I just went on a tangent because I, I love that question. Um, you know, so, um, yeah. <laughs> Quackers. Yes. Heard the moth story. Yeah. It's a fantastic, fantastic case study. So <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, Sir Douglas Bain, uh, fish used to, uh, that use red light uh, can still see it, so they must have started somewhere where seeing red light was useful before developing red uh, bioluminescence. Maybe. Uh, possibly. That's, 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 a, that's a good um, hypothesis, actually. So, very, very, very possible. This is super cool. Also, Anvil Shark. Sorry, I meant to look that up. I'm going to play this clip and look up Anvil Shark really quick. Because I think I know which one you mean. I I want to I want to make sure I've got this right. Because that's a, pre a really cool prehistoric species. Yes, Stenocanthus was anvil shark. Okay, just to make sure I was tracking on the same page. Really cool prehistoric species. So, um, blue eye robotics. Uh, I've never heard of this before, but uh, it's kind of cool seeing more and more. Um, like that. I'm assuming it's kind of more like a private thing, but it's got some great footage of this lantern shark. So we'll slow this down to get a better view of it. 122 meters, uh, that's kind of the middle of the sunlit zone. Um, so it's probably the middle of the sunlit zone at night. The Matra spinax, pretty famous species of lantern shark. So let's go ahead and slow this down just to see some stuff. Okay. 
kind of curious if there's um, more information in the video description. But this is an individual that's cruising. Um, got that really cool cool torpedo body. You can still see a little bit of like the very dark belly, like um, like how that's like pretty sharply demarcated from the rest of the body. It's a pretty cool look. You can see a little bit of it coming up. That's really cool. And it's hard to tell because uh, this could be just the robot moving because it's hard to tell if this the shark and the robot are going against the current or if this is just kind of like a more static environment just all these like little speckles or specks here very cool let's see where this was filmed uh northeast atlantic ocean da, 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 da. does not show where this was filmed okay no worries uh pretty cool clip um we've got another lantern shark Antarctica's deep sea dwellers, so completely different species, but uh, 1280 meters. This is in the midnight zone. Ah, that's a cool clip. Definitely a different species. This one is a little squatter, it's a little fat, <laughs> which I kind of like. Um, and it doesn't have that color pattern of the other species that we saw. It kind of, this one has more of a uniform color pattern, like uniformly dark. Um, and it's chubby. It's like, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, slow that down. I actually really want to see the chunk a little bit. Lantern shark at 1280 meters. Midnight zone. Oh, there's a little Brill star right here, actually. It's barely in the light. Uh, current's probably very strong. This little guy is definitely being pushed sideways. Uh, this one, I wonder if these are two different species, because, like, this one's really cool. It's, um, it's definitely more compact looking. It, it's not as narrow as Amopterus spinax. This one's got a little bit of a belly. Uh, the fins even look a little bit larger and a little bit more rounded. So overall, it's kind of more of, like, this cute, like, adorable, like, compact appearance. Uh, curious if they have the species in this, because that's... Let's see, it's a lantern shark. <laughs> other people, other people are like, it's adorable. One more time, because it is quite cute. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, we'll probably have time to check out, uh, let's figure out what lantern sharks live in the Antarctic. Um, I think we'll probably have time to figure out what species this might be. One thing I love about lantern sharks is they are cute, but um, that's not the only thing going for them. And as far as, like, I love that they're so unique in the fact that they light up. Um, so it's like, there are a lot of things at once. They can be very cute, but they can also be, you know, these cool deep water light up um, cousins of dogfish. They have the spines on the back. Um, so classic squall form spines. Um, yeah, awesome little predators. Some old drawing of a lantern shark. Little clip of bioluminescence as far as um, just the general idea. I think we all are familiar with what it is, but some animals produce uh, light through photophores. That's a really cool shot. Uh, 2,800 feet. So that is... Hold on. Let me figure out how deep that is. Uh, this is from 2004, in August. Feet to meters, because we'll we'll never learn. It's sad. Two eight five six. 870 meters. So that's um, twilight zone. Four degrees Celsius, which is ridiculously cold. It's really really cold. Almost freezing. Um. It's grainy footage, but still really cool to see like old footage of a lantern shark. It's probably one of the first. That blue that that blue clip is probably one of the first shots of lantern sharks ever, like alive in the wild. 
because before before we had like this kind of level of underwater photography you know you would rely on like trawl surveys uh to pull up lantern sharks um that's actually really sorry that's actually a pretty good photo uh, also of the color pattern uh, where you can see the extremely dark belly um and then a little bit of that coppery back um like like this this dark gray coppery back very cool but that deep water clip probably one of the first shots of lantern sharks ever so one thing that I, I hope like as far as um you know as we keep kind of careening through time and uh new technology emerges i hope we never take for granted the fact that we're able to see these kinds of images of sharks so quickly and so easily um you know not just on youtube but like you know any like private museum collections or like other video services it's really cool to see like like i i i mean you know i'm a young person and like i have not I did not grow up with this, you know, so it's, it's really, really cool to see this. Like, like it's, it's pretty astounding that we live in an age where we can actually have these images and see these animals. It's so, so cool. So, so we've got one more clip. This is a YouTube short, but I just thought it was really cool because look at that. You can see the shark, really great shot of the shark, just bumping into this pretty nice clean video. So you could get a really nice shot of the face. And the one thing is, I like that it's a short because it automatically repeats, so we can kind of keep seeing over and over again some details. Again, I love seeing very clearly that color pattern, um, that like nice, very onyxy belly, which has all the photophores, contrasted with like that you know dark coppery gray back. Really, really cool shot. So. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just gonna catch up on some. <laughs> Catching up on some con uh, comments. Uh, Howard, this is really cool. Um, I love the history of paleontology. The pioneers did not have any sophisticated tools at their disposal. Yes, agreed, agreed, so. <laughs> <laughs> Old shark drawings never fail to be utterly horrifying. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, some of them are very good from like, it's funny, some of them from the 1700s, very good. Some of them also from the 1700s, just wildly off, 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 off. So, <laughs> uh, Sir Douglas Bain, ironically, deep sea gigantification didn't work on lantern sharks. Yes, I, interesting. That's a, that's, a <laughs> that would be so cool. Just imagine like, like, that would be a great, like, made-up shark species concept. Like, a giant, huge, bioluminescent shark. That would be fun, you know. Oh, my gosh. Super cool. <laughs> yeah, so this shot, super great. It's nice to see uh, a head-on profile of the lantern shark. So, I think uh, we'll, since it's getting closer to the time, we'll switch over to some research and some more details on our specific species... Emopterus virens. So this species was named after Big or by sorry named by Bigelow and Schroeder, uh, some of the most famous ichthyologists, um, at least in the United States. Uh, they were huge names in the Northeast, so um, a lot of cool research came from Bigelow and Schroeder. Um, I, one of my favorite books, uh, Fish, Fishes of the Gulf of Maine. Um, they they are the authors of that. So these these are very respected names in. I think, I think just in all ichthyology, uh, so not, not just sharks, even though they did a lot of really good work with sharks, but just all of the ichthyology, pretty, pretty big names. So. so it's really cool to see a species discovered by them, uh, named by them. So 1953. Um, the, re the original description is new and little known sharks from the Atlantic and from the Gulf of Mexico. And I think we have that study. Uh, so this is the entry of the original description this is from Harvard, and we'll kind of zoom in so we can get a better look at the text. And what I'm hoping for as we as we kind of skim skim through this is um, one thing I really love about oh it's a little too close. 
older papers and older research is that there's room for a little bit more um, prose. Like, it's a little bit... Um, or maybe I'm thinking of poetry. It's a little bit more flowery. Like, the language is a little bit more... Um, sometimes the language can be a little bit more, like, romanticized, and I really like that. So, uh, let's check it out. This is this is part of the original description from the 50s. So, Genus and Mopterus. These little dark-colored deep-water squalids are characterized by having a prodded spine at the interior margin, margin of each dorsal fin. Um, and I'll just kind of read out things that kind of stand out to me. So... Okay, well, yeah, there we go. This, I think this stuff is really cool. Um, upper teeth with several cusps, but lower teeth with only one cusp, and those in each side of the jaw directed so sharply outward that the inner margins of the successive cusps form an almost unbroken cutting edge. Like, I don't know, I can't really quite pinpoint it, but there's just something about the way that sentence is written. It's like, it's a little more visceral than... Like I feel like I feel like some modern fish descriptions are a bit more clinical, and like this feels a little bit more like, oh yeah, you know we know that these sharks have like a cool blade mouth. So some members also of the genus are luminescent. Several of them have much darker color below than above, and several have conspicuous dark markings of characteristic shape on the flanks. Color character is unusual among sharks. Very cool. Interesting. The dozen species that have been described from one part of the ocean or another are divided by Fowler into two subgen subgenera, uh, Emopterus, uh, let's see, and Acanthidium. That's a cool, that, that's not active. Interesting. Cool name, though. Uh, Acanth, wait, yeah, Acanth means spine in Latin. So uh, one of my favorite dinosaurs is Acrocanthosaurus. Acrocanthosaurus, um, acanth uh, refers to like its spiny back. It kind of um, looks like a, um, it's like a spinosaurus, but with a very lower sail, like a, a much lower, like this, it's kind of more like a ridgeback dinosaur. So, um, but it's cool. It's a cool Latin word, acanth. So it re in this case, acanthidium refers to the spines on the dorsal fins of these dogfish or these lantern sharks. Sorry. So. Let's see. Examination of available material does not seem to us to justify subdivision of the genus on this basis. Da, 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 da. We'll kind of keep skimming through it. Because these are more like meristics, like descriptions. Up to the present time, four species have been described from the North Atlantic with its tributary seas. Amopterus spinax, North African and European waters from Cape Verde, Morocco, to the Azores to Norway, including the Mediterranean report from South Africa, Amopterus pusillus, Cape Verde Islands, Azores, also in Japan, Amopterus hylianus, southern Florida, North Atlantic, but North America, and off, off end of the Chesapeake Bay, and Amopterus princeps. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Okay, so apparently there was a ship, I'm assuming this is a ship name, the exper uh, called the Oregon. So the experimental trawlings of the Oregon in the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico have now brought to light two additional members of the genus that cannot be referred to any species of, of Amopterus previously known, whether from the Atlantic or from the Indo-Pacific. They are described here as Amopterus schultzi and as Amopterus virens. So this, is, this paper is literally the first account of the green lantern shark in the world. So this is the first time this has ever been recorded, which is really cool. I'm just going to scan through this. It's a lot of details on just the history of Homopterus and the genus. Oh, this is cool. Okay. 
So uh, apparently, this is actually really cool to see. This is an old paper with a dichotomous key. Uh, we won't go through the whole key, but it's cool to have these. Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar, uh, it's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure, except uh, you take the shark that you're trying to identify, and you uh, compare it to these two different options. Uh, if it's the first option, you go to part one. If it's the second option, you go to part two, and so on and so on and so forth. So, so, uh, we, won't uh, we won't do that tonight, tonight because, because we don't, we don't, we don't have, 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 have holding the holding the lantern charger. So, so, so um, uh, I think that we're going to do to do. But but these are these are I always think these are fun to kind of play around with. With. Um, uh, especially, especially like, for any kind of species, species, species dichotomous, dichotomous keys are really, keys are really cool, cool as far as, as, far as um, uh, identifying animals. animals. So, so, um, and it kind and of kind of narrows down what the features you should be looking for, for that make the main species unique. unique. So we so can, can read the, the thing that makes our species unique, unique if the key gets that far. I won't spend a lot of time on this. I th think I don't think the key includes Emopterus virens because it's a new lantern shark. So we'll just kind of keep looking. Um, I just want to get to the actual Emopterus virens account. And if we can't find it, then um, we'll just kind of move on. So. Uh, random, by the way, but um, it's not a dichotomous key, but someone, I don't know if anybody is a Pokemon fan out there, I'm a huge Pokemon fan, but um, someone made a phylogenetic tree of all the Pokemon, which is crazy. I forget, it's, I think I saw it somewhere on Reddit or something, but like, um, like I'm not like a Redditor, but sometimes like I'll hop on to see like junk, <laughs> like like fun fun content just like this. Uh, there was a there was a dichotomy or sorry a phylogenetic tree of all the Pokemon. It was actually pretty good. Um, I think if anyone's a Pokemon fan, it's a good Google search because um, they did a good job. They looked for similar derived features, uh, assuming Mew as the evolutionary root. So, Mothra um, Schultze. Here we go, Mothra Virens. So let's see. I'm just going to scan through this, make sure there's anything kind of cool about the original description. Uh, so the first specimen, the type, um, so the type specimen uh, on which the species is named was pulled from the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's kind of cool to see, like, the modern range map of this species is exactly there. So um, Amopterus virens lives in Gulf of Mexico. And look how it's sticking to kind of like this slope area so this is where the continental shelf plunges down into the deep it's really cool to see it's on the shelf edge so gulf of mexico um in between florida and bahamas all the way up to um the carolin the edge of the carolinian atlantic uh, so very subtropical to tropical species we do have it in the caribbean which is pretty cool um and then this is the yucatan peninsula if i'm not mistaken so very very cool These are very specific. Oh, here we go. Okay, so they caught the type specimen and 42 others. So the this collection had 42 green lantern sharks, males and females, including an embryo ready for birth from the same general region, Oregon stations, 321. And there are the coordinates right here, 200 fathoms. Gotcha. U.S. National Museum and Museum of Comparative Zoology. Got you. Here's all the specific measurements, which we don't really need to go into tonight. These are very important for fish identification, and especially for naming a species. But um, they're they're a lot. So. <laughs> Hmm. It's kind of interesting. Uh, head flattened above. Uh, snout fleshy. Its interior contour forming an angle about 90 degrees. 
Its lateral outlines form narrow breast of the eyes. A pattern of mucus pores and a lower surface visible thanks to the nakedness of the skin there. Um, mucus pores. So I don't know if they're talking about the Ampullae Lorenzini or if that's if they're referring to something else. Da, 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 da. Yeah, these are all descriptions. I'm hoping there's something about... They probably couldn't write anything about behavior, but I'm just kind of curious if there's any unique observations. And if there's not, we can keep moving. Also, this is a pretty good example of, like, you think like measuring sharks is easy like it's it's um there's so much that like there's so much that you can like that was like three pages just of description there's so much that you can kind of like compare and like analyze it's it's wild actually here we go here's something kind of interesting color perhaps the most striking feature of this new species is its pattern of darker and paler markings easier represented pictorially than described verbally in general, the upper parts of the trunk are sooty brown above the level of the or origins of the pectoral fins, darkest along the back, but interrupted on each side by two narrow longitudinal stripes of pale bluish gray. Let's see. I love that phrase, by the way, that it's like, this color, this is basically, it's basically saying, um, this is not easy to describe, it's easier represented pictorially. It's like, let, we, we got to show you, as opposed to tell you. That's interesting. Um, the region of the gill openings is pale brownish gray. So too are comma-shaped patches extending downward from be before and behind the gill openings. There's a pale oval patch behind each eye and a considerable pale area on the lower surface of the rear half of the tail sector of the trunk. Uh, contrasting sharply with this pale area as the lower surface of the snout is very dark bluish gray or blue, ba blue black. So here is kind of part of like what they're talking about a little bit. So this is a obviously recent image of a green lantern shark. Um, so here are some, some of those could be damaged, um, but you can definitely see weird mix of like dark coloration and like pale patterns here. Um, this is an illustration, but um, it's, probably, it's probably better to see like a live individual. I wonder if we have some other pictures. It's an x-ray image. Not a lot of actual images in life of Green Lantern Sharks. Yeah, it's hard to tell if that's a damaged specimen or if that is um, part of that, like the pale area that they're talking about. Here on fish baits, this is a pretty damaged specimen right here. So that's kind of hard to compare to. This is the original description, which is really cool. So this kind of wildly long um, entry I was reading, um, here is the actual illustration from that entry. Okay, this is what they're talking about. There we go, sorry. So right behind the eyes, you have that pale patch right here. And then um, these lighter areas right here are the pale patches that they're talked about. And this is why they're saying this is a really weird, complex pattern. Because it's like, okay, you have this pale patch right here, but then you have like the normal color palette. But then you have this extremely dark um, pattern right here and on the belly. So it's very complicated to explain in writing. So we, won't, we will not spend more time on that actual paper. Um, but it was really cool to see, like, this is the original, that was the original description of the species, uh, from the 50s, so. And then, here's another illustration from Bigelow and Schroeder. Um, same thing, you've got these, the pale patch behind the eye, um, these pale lines, 
around the center of the body, but then you got this, like, dark... It almost reminds me of, like, a, a reverse killer whale, if that makes any sense. Like, you know how, like, orca whales have the white... Um, I don't know if you call that, like, a, a cape? I don't know if that's the right word for it, because I think a cape's on the back. Um, flank? I forget, I forget the right word for this kind of color pattern, but, like, it's almost, it, it reminds me of the opposite of it, where it's, like, this, like, dark streak um, going up from the belly. So it's it's pretty cool. It's it's probably a complicated pattern to remember, but this alternating, this unique alternating mix of like pale lines and dark um, dark bars. It's cool to see that this is part of what makes this species unique. Um, if we go back to maybe this image of the animal on the side, there we go. You, now that we know what we're looking for, you can kind of see it actually. Yes. Okay. Here we go. So this section right here is damaged, but here, this is like, it's it's not good in this photograph, but here's like the pale area behind the eye. But more importantly, here's the pale area right here, but then that characteristic like dark, like um, it's almost like a scythe, like, or like a, like a hook. It's, it's, hard, it's hard for me to describe what this is, just like the original description said, but there's that like dark area juxtaposed with the pale area further juxtaposed by like just the normal color pattern on the back so this is a very complex complexly patterned shark uh which is cool to see so very cool i'm gonna keep this image up for a second i want to catch up on the comments i'm so sorry that took a while uh let's see uh Oh, <laughs> sorry. I just see a lot of comments on the Pokemon thing. That's so funny. I uh, literally know that convergent evolution was too common in Pokemon for physical features to be reliable tool for organization research. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> oh, Quackers, as an artist, dot shading is super helpful when trying to make shapes uh, your note used to uh, because you can just keep adding on to it until it looks right. Awesome. Very cool. Very, very cool. So, <laughs> uh, Minjus, uh, yes, it feels like they really romanticize their work and their writing. Yes, it's really, it's cool. Um, like, older papers, I love it when they do that. Um, but, uh, sorry. Like, I, I love it when they do that. Um, but, like, uh, it, it's, it's like, uh, sometimes, sometimes, like, it can get a little, like, like, for the most part, I love it when they do that. I I've read a couple that lean into, like, the monster version of sharks, like, uh, not Bigelow and Schroeder, they're usually pretty good about that, but there's some older papers that actually have talked about, like, have painted the shark as, like, oh, it's a monster, like, <laughs> or, like, it's, it's, it, it, like, like, to describe it, it's, like, a gargantuan size, so... Um, but pretty interesting. So, nope, actually. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, let's see. So, interrelationships of the Amopteridae uh, chondrichthys squaliforms. This is a paper from the 90s. Uh, we'll kind of scan through it, or skim through it. But um, we're jumping from the 50s to the 90s, so 40 years into the future. Um, this is by Shigeru Shirai and Kazuhiro Nakaya. A cladistic, oops, sorry. A cladistic analysis of the Amopterine sharks was conducted based on skeletal, muscular, and external characters using the outgroup rule. Within the squall forms, the subfamily Amopterinae should be recognized as a monophyletic group by having the following Automorphies, cool word. Uh, keel process of basal cranii present, and labial cartilage is composed of two separate parts. Uh, the present study indicates that Amopterus plus Centroscillium shikoi and the rest of Centroscillium plus Aculeola are sister groups. These findings necessitate that Centroscillium shikoi must be raised to the generic rank, Microscillium. Diagnostic characteristics are given for these natural taxa. So we'll just kind of skim through this. Um, it's cool to see how revisions have happened through time. Um, so our lantern shark is in the, uh, it's Emopteridae, and then Emopterinae is subfamily. 
if I'm reading this correctly, oh yeah, this is, wow, okay, I need to take a swig of tea, because I'm not rapidly realizing what's going on with this diagram. Wow, okay. So, when was this made? This was... Okay. Okay, this figure. Uh, the phylogenetic relationships used in the present character analysis based on Compagno 1973. Um, so, this is the phylogenetic tree from the 70s. <laughs> and you can see that um, once upon a time, there was a giant family called Squalidae. We still have Squalidae, but it has lantern sharks, dogfish sharks, <sighs> Dania, I think that's arrowhead dogfish. Oh gosh, rough sharks, uh, Greenland sharks, like sleeper sharks, and um, kite fin sharks, all in the same family. Uh, so this has since been updated. So um, each of these basically has its own family. Um, Amoptera day, uh, Somniosa day, Delicia day. Um, so basically acknowledging that like, wow, all these sharks are actually less closely related than we thought. They deserve to be in their own family. They don't, they should not be lumped into this catch-all called Squalidae, um, which is kind of funny. Um, if anybody has seen the 70s Jaws, um, Hooper makes a comment that uh, the Great White is a Squalus, uh, which is kind of funny. Like, that's a, um, I always got confused what he meant by that, uh, but I guess squalus referred to any kind of shark or something like that. But um, it's kind of amazing. Like today, that would not make any sense at all. Like uh, you know, it, it it it's just point being like taxonomy just changes so much through time. Um, you know, so rapidly when you think about it. Uh, just in two years, tiger sharks got their own family. Sand tigers got their own family. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy actually like even in my lifetime just like just to see changes like that they're pretty huge interesting so yeah probably don't have a lot of details on our green lantern shark da, 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 da. but even so it's cool to kind of see okay once upon a time it was considered to be in the same family as like much larger sharks like the greenland shark so that's pretty crazy. So, <laughs> Quacker Squall Day was originally uh, just stick it in there. Yep. <laughs> uh, so Douglas Bain. So they just dumped all the weird sharks in one family. <laughs> Love it. Oh my gosh. Oh, Minjus, imagine how much is going to change in the future. Yeah, so I have, I, so we have a lot of um, uh, new viewers on the stream because I think I made this comment last year, uh, but I have a fun secret suspicion. This is just a gut feeling. This is no science. This is just a gut feeling. But I have a fun secret suspicion that I think there's a thousand sharks in the world. That is my fun gut feeling secret suspicion that as we continue to go through time, discover more deep sea areas, uh, mostly actually like examine the genetics of species, I really feel like just gut feeling, dumb gut feeling, I think there's a thousand species of sharks. So um, that's my prediction. We'll see what happens uh, because right now we are at 500... My last official number was like 514, but I think the new number is like 520, 530. And that's exploded since like, I think early 90s was like 360, you know? So between the early 90s and now, like that's, that's a lot of sharks that we've discovered. So um, there's still a lot of places that are just really not surveyed very well um, in the world, you know? Uh, and like not just like deep water places but like there are some shallow water places that are just not surveyed very well and then the crazy thing is species complexes where um like this is also something i've talked about last year um i don't know how many of the, the newer viewers have no, uh like have heard this but like there's quite a few groups of sharks that are very well known that we're wondering oh 
are how genetically distinct are these and could they could these be different species so the famous ones are bull sharks um and i believe sandbar sharks are suspected to be different species so um right now they're considered potentially to be a species complex which is um it's named one species like carcharanus lucas is a bull shark carcharanus plumbius is a sandbar shark but there's a couple distinct populations in the world that we're kind of like ah they don't really genetically interact that much and then on top of that some of them look to look a little physically different um pacific sandbar sharks they can look kind of different from atlantic sandbar sharks um and i think it's a proportionality of their dorsal fins so there's a suspicion that that might be a different that those might be two species um, a proven example of this has been uh, the spiny dogfish, or piked dogfish. Um, that was recently separated into two different species. So, um, originally we thought there was one Squalus acanthias, but the Atlantic species and the Pacific species were like, oh no, these don't, these don't interact. They don't mate. They actually are genetically distinct. So the Pacific spiny dogfish is its own species called Squalus succlii, um, and then the Atlantic one is still Squalus acanthias. Similarly, there's a suspicion that, like, Atlantic bull sharks, South African bull sharks, and Pacific bull sharks really may not mate. And, like, they may be, like, genetically distinct populations to the point where they could be different species. So I think it's really cool. So I think between that, like, the idea of species complexes, um, all the crazy revision we've been doing recently... And then the fact there's a lot of places to still explore in the world, um, you know, both in the deep water environment and then also shallow water environments. Like, you know, there's places we haven't really truly gotten a good sense of, like, what's there, you know. So I, I really feel like I, a thousand is my, fi is my little secret prediction. I, I, that's my guess, you know, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Um, Quaggers, we, uh, we think we're so smart now, 20 years into the future, some is going to be talking about us the same way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Sir Douglas Bane, you know, the squirrels are descended from sharks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love these gut feeling uh, comments. This is fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's just it's just a feeling. So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, like I don't know. It'll be cool. Like you know, ages from now, if 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 someone pulls up this video someday, it'll be like, oh, they were right. Doctor Jaws, a thousand sharks. He got it. I hope. I hope that's the case. Well, but we'll see what happens. Um, we were on the '90s, so let's move ahead to. 2010, I think what we'll do is we'll check out, uh, this is the, um, 2010 or 2000, no, this is 2020, sorry, 2020, so this is the most recent, I, okay, this is the most recent one, so we'll check out the actual entry for Iosum Red List, um, but as you can already see, the Green Lantern Shark is least concerned, so it's doing okay, which is great, it's always great to see a least concerned shark, that's one of my favorite things about this channel and this stream, is that we've been seeing a nice number of least concerned sharks. Um, sharks, rightfully so, are um, regarded as endangered, vulnerable you know, spe uh, animals that are not doing well. And a lot of them are not. Like a third of them, at least, are threatened in some kind of major way. Um, but And it's good that we're bringing attention to those species, but sometimes it can be kind of depressing. Um, so it's, it's nice to balance that with um, just like that that counterbalance of like, oh, hey, you know, some sharks are fine. Some sharks are actually doing okay. We're always going to have sharks. Sharks are going to outlast us, I swear. Like, they're, they're just so resilient. They're so diverse. Um, they're incredible animals. So we'll always have sharks. Um, so it's, ni it's nice to see some of the species that are doing fine. Um, and the fact that there's quite a few of them that are actually doing fine. So... Like, and like, just as a kind of a quick and dirty breakdown, I... For me, I'm kind of like a third are fine, a third are probably like, yeah, they could be doing better, and then a third are like, okay, they're not, they're not doing okay. Like if you broke all sharks down, I feel like blocking off into those thirds is kind of a quick and dirty breakdown of like their actual conservation needs. So, but it's always good to be protective though, as far as just like or conservative on 
conservation protection as far as like yeah when in doubt let's try to give them the best shot possible because it, it's so easy for like sharks to crash um just because they grow so slowly reproduce so slowly it's so they're so easy and so sensitive like they're so easy to crash and they're so sensitive to just you know screw up like their fishery or their population so it's always good to be on the safe side and be protective of sharks so um but anyway, uh, the Green Lantern Shark, Amopterus virens, is a small deepwater shark with a widespread distribution, western central Atlantic, ranging from the Georgia, <laughs> I love that, the Georgia, USA, down through the Bahamas and Cuba into the northern Gulf of Mexico to Venezuela. I actually really love that part. <laughs> the Georgia. Haha. <laughs> they live in the Georgia. I, th I think it's really funny. Sorry, I said. I said is awesome. I'm just, I'm just being silly, but... This is a poorly known species occurring on the outer continental shelves and slopes at depths of 196 to 915 meters. So lower sunlit zone, pretty deep twilight zone. Uh, no information is available on interactions with fisheries. And while it's a potential bycatch of demersal trawl fisheries from the outer continental shelf, its wide depth range provides it with an extensive refuge as there's a general lack of deep water fisheries in the Caribbean. The population trend is estimated to be increasing for great lantern shark. Therefore, the species is assessed as least concern. Uh, you know what's kind of interesting? Is this typo? The population trend is estimated to be increasing for Great Lantern Shark. So, I just want to read the Great Lantern Shark's profile. I just want to see if that's a copy-paste kind of thing, out of curiosity. Um, that one's is Hylianus. Right. Okay, hold on. Great. Princeps. Sorry, I got that wrong. Princeps. I should know that one. Great lantern shark. So there's a great lantern shark and a green lantern shark. Okay, uh, it's a different entry. Okay, so I'm assuming with this green lantern shark entry, maybe what they're saying is that, okay, the great lantern shark is more well known. We know that great lantern sharks are actually doing okay, so maybe its cousin, the green lantern shark, is probably okay. I'm assuming that's what they're saying. So I just wanted to check that really quick. Also, what I think is really interesting is this is the second species we've seen in this part of the world and i'm referring specifically to kind of like the bahamas like this this kind of like deep water florida bahamas caribbean area that is doing okay um we recently reviewed a species that also lived in this area that was like fine which is kind of interesting to me um because like it makes sense, uh, but uh, like the idea that like there's not really a lot of deep water fishing in this area, um, I don't know. That's kind of fascinating to me. That I wonder, I, I wonder if maybe there's some. I wonder if I hesitate to say this because like um, as like like we've had two sharks that kind of pop up in this area as like oh they're actually doing okay, you know. Um, and, I, and I was about to say, like, I wonder if, like, maybe there's something advantageous about, like, just the Florida Bahamas as far as, like, deep water fishing goes and as far as, like, maybe it's a low impact area in a way. And I really hesitate to say that because some of the most critically endangered elasmobranchs, like um, the sawfish, the, you know, th this is a big area where they're collected. They're protected, but, like, you know it's a critically endangered species and they spend most of the time in this same area. So I really hesitate to say that it might be kind of like a relatively safe ish spot for sharks, but I just found it very interesting that this is another deep water shark species in the Florida Bahamas area that is actually doing well. Um, so I don't know, let's put a pin in that and kind of keep an eye on that. Um, it's reminiscent of, like, we've seen a lot of really cool things about sharks in New Zealand and sharks in Australia, whereas, like, conservation efforts have done really great for those sharks. Like, like 
like sharks in that part of the world, like usually Australia and New Zealand sharks are very like comparatively well managed, like comparatively like really benefiting from that management. Um, so I'm, I don't know. Let's keep let's put a pin in the Bahamas, Florida area as far as like I wonder if there's something about this setup that might be beneficial at least to deep water sharks because this is the second deep water shark in the same kind of habitat where it's like oh it's actually doing all right very interesting let's see um fish base let's go back to the fish base profile and then we'll wrap up with our final study which is going to be the coolest uh it's bioluminescence i think we've seen this study before but um it's with a different species it's definitely going to be cool to revisit with an actual lantern shark so um but with fish base let's check this out uh Emopterus, the greek for uh sieve or enthmoid enthmoid's bone uh, gr uh petron means wing so um, the Greek word Amopterus means sleeve wing. It's kind of an odd name, actually. Virens, um, I believe that must mean green, like, um, uh, because the vir root. Um, I think virens probably means green. Like, Viridian City. Oh, well. But anyway. Um, biology. Found on the upper continental slopes. Probably form schools. We also feed communally on large squid. Then maybe too large for a single individual. Interesting. Okay interesting let's read that again that's actually kind of cool may also feed communally on large squid that may be too large for a single individual so fun fact a cousin like the dogfish like pike dogfish they can dismember prey larger than themselves if they're in a group um i keep talking about jurassic park but it's kind of always reminds me of like the lost world with the tiny compsognathus dinosaurs going after the guy um yeah, I, I just think it's really cool. Um, we know that, like, dogfish can do that, uh, dismember prey larger than themselves. Like, not huge, crazy prey, but, like, they can dismember prey larger than themselves. Um, it's kind of cool to see this idea of, like, uh, the green lantern shark possibly might feed communally on large squid that may be too large for a single individual. And we know that another cousin, uh, the cookie cutter shark, absolutely takes bites out of prey items larger than themselves. So, I don't know. Kind of an interesting idea. Um, let's see, we've got one more paper, um, cause again, since it is a rare, like not well-known species, um, there wasn't a lot of cool stuff that's like focused specifically on this group, uh, except for this glow on sharks, state of the art on bioluminescence research, which is going to be really cool. I think this looks familiar, but we'll definitely go through it again. If so, because I mean, you know, bioluminescence is always fun to review. Um, this is by... Uh, Lornet Dechatele, I apologize if I cannot pronounce that correctly, uh, Julian M. Kleis, <laughs> Jerome Delrosi, Patrick Fleming, and Jerome Malefet. So, uh, I apologize if I do not... Belgium, Belgium. So, I apologize uh, if, if, if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. This is the Marine Biology Laboratory Earth and Life Institute in Belgium. Um... Uh, Bio Biology and Marine Organisms Biometrics Unit, Research Institute for Biosciences, University of Mons, and also Belgium. So this is going to be a cool study, though. Um, before we get started, I think it's probably a good time to think about <laughs> the Georgia. Um, I think it's going to be a good time to think about next week's shark. So um, I have no idea what to do as far as a species uh, i feel like i've been guiding a little bit but like uh, i'm open to a lot of different species the only one uh that we want to save for episode 100 is the great white and i would also say we probably should avoid lamniforms in general because we did a lot last year but that's that's my only thing um also i am working on something kind of fun to do later this year um so have a fun project that uh, is about a certain group of sharks that I'm excited about. So, oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Sir, <laughs> Sir Douglas Bain, our prehistoric sharks on the table. So, um, <laughs> so okay. I was I was vaguely talking about the fun project, but like um, 
I guess I'll, I guess I'll just share that like I have a prehistoric pro- shark project uh, coming down the pipeline, hoping hoping for March um, that uh, I have a collaborator on hopefully. So um, we're kind of putting this together. It's going to be really cool. So um, for the mainstream, uh, I think we should stick with living sharks uh, for a couple reasons. Um, one, I do want to do like something kind of special for prehistoric sharks. But two, um, probably more importantly, it's um, I think it's important to do as many living sharks as possible um, and to like make the main episodes living shark episodes uh, because part of it is conservation and part of it is like we want to spread awareness as far as like the living the sharks that are alive today that might be facing some issues um, you know and we have a nice collection again of sharks that some that are doing okay some that are not doing okay um, so I think for now uh, especially since there's like over 500 sharks at the time of this recording um, I think we should stick for living sharks for now, but we are setting up a, a fossil episode, um, a special thing uh, later this year. And when I mean later, I'm, I'm kind of thinking the spring would be a good time to do something special with prehistoric sharks. So that is coming down the pipeline. Um, I'm just working on that uh, on the back end, but I think it's going to be, I have a fun idea for what we could do with that. So stay tuned for that. Um, but for next week, I think we should do a living shark, uh, to answer your question. Um, so like, I think as far as a group goes, it's been a while since we've done, let's see, I'm kind of cycling through some of the groups in my head. Um, there are, we did a cat shark recently, but there are some weird sharks between cat sharks and kind of like the bigger sharks we have actually we actually haven't done a bigger shallow water shark in a while so um we could do a carcharhinus it's been a while since we've done carcharhinus but there's also let's see i'm just pulling up the family barbled hound shark that's a good one that's actually that's exactly in that range between cat shark and um uh yeah let's do it uh that's that's exactly between that range of cat shark and um like bigger carcarina shark so let's definitely do barbled hound shark so that one is i know i had this here that's a good pick um the scientific name is escaping me actually do you have the scientific name for that because that is gonna that's a good choice and it's definitely in that range of like good like mid-sized shark there we go triacus skillia no that's banded hound shark sorry banded hound shark almost there yeah i could probably look this up but pride is okay Okay, I gotta look it up. <laughs> Hold on. That's a good suggestion, because it's, it's definitely in that range. Barbled. I mistyped that. There we go. Nice. Okay, there we go. Oh, this is good. This one's going to be cool. Carcarina forms Leptocaridae. Okay. Hell, yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> awesome, 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 awesome. Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sir Douglas Bain. This is an excellent suggestion, so we're definitely going to do this. Uh, super, super cool. Barbled Hound Shark, Leptocarius uh, Smithy. Uh, this is the first one that took me a while to actually remember the scientific name, so or find it. So thank, uh, thank you. This this is pretty cool, and uh, it is the first shark uh, ever on our stream in Leptocaridae. So that's exactly that's a great species between um, like the smaller Carcharhinoforms and the larger Carcharhinoforms. So that is what we're gonna do next week. It's also a great. Um, shark species that's kind of more in need of our help because it's vulnerable and uh, this is going to be really cool this is a uh, West African species uh, so this is going to be a super cool stream so uh, yeah, Barbled Hound Shark we are, we're doing, that is official for next week so, awesome thank you, thank you 
And I'm going to star that because great suggestion. So thank you, Sir Douglas Bang. That is fantastic. Uh, we'll do that one next week. So, all right. So it's uh, 1030. We'll wrap up with this study glow on sharks. Uh, I almost emailed somebody. don't want to do that. <laughs> all right. This review presents a s synthesis of shark bioluminescence knowledge. Up-to-date bioluminescent sharks are found only in squaliforms and specifically in Emoptera Day, the lantern shark, uh, Delacia Day, the kite fin shark, and Somniosidae, uh, the um, sleeper shark families. State-of-the-art knowledge about, about the evolution, ecological functions, histological structure, sorry, get out of there, uh, the associated squamation and physiological physiological control of the photogenic organs of these elusive deep sea sharks is presented special focus is given to their unique and singular hormonal luminescence control mechanism in this context the implications of the photophore associated extraocular photoreception which complements the visual adaptations of bioluminescent sharks to perceive residual downwelling light and luminescence in dim light environment and the hormonally hormonally based luminescence control is depicted in detail Similarities and differences between shark families are highlighted and support the hypothesis of an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary unique ancestral appearance of luminescence in the Lazarbranchs. Finally, potential areas for future research on shark luminescence are presented. Very cool. So let's take a look. I just want to bounce into this awesome phylogenetic tree. This is really cool. So figure one, shark luminescence distribution within squaliform families based on published phylogenies. The circles inside the tree represents the luminous blue, expected luminous gray, and non-luminous white status of each represented species. Uh, statuses are based on in vivo pictures, physiological studies, luminous, uh, the presence of photophores or flank marks, expected luminous, and none of these criteria non-luminous. Uh, circles outside the tree scale to the number of species number in brackets within given family indicate the proportion of luminous blue expected luminous gray as well as non-luminous white species this is gonna be so cool uh, for each family total number of luminous expected luminous non-luminous species are given next to the outside circle blue star indicates the expected origin of luminous luminescence and sharks this is super cool okay let's zoom in so we can get a better look at this because this is freaking rad actually all right, so, okay, we got to go back. Okay, so this point right here, I don't know if you could see it. I wonder how, okay. So, do I have this right? Okay, so this point right here, this is kind of like the outlier of, um, all these squaliform sharks. So you have Hexantius griseus, which is a six scale shark. And then you actually have, I'm sorry, these are not squaliforms, these are more than squaliforms. So you've got these outliers right here, six scale shark right here. You have man, a bunch of these other, if you go up the tree, like this is like the most basal root. If you go up the tree, you have all these other species like um, saw sharks, that's a Japanese saw shark. Saw shark. Uh, uh, Phyotrema, I believe another is another small shark, shark actually, actually is a six scale six six small shark. shark. There are some, there are some small sharks that are six scale, six scale, really cool, really cool. Uh, Squatina, uh, Squatina, Angel shark. shark, and then a kind, and then a kind of rhinos, 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 rhinos,
So all of these are the outliers. Then you go to this root of the tree, the blue star, and this is where bioluminescence begins. And it radiates in this group of squall forms, which is super cool. So you got this branch, Delacius lucca, the kite fin shark, um, Isisteus, these are cookie cutter sharks, Mollusquama, these are pocket sharks, Eupritomicri, uh, sorry, Eupritomicroids, Squaliosa, yeah, Squaliolus, uh, Heteroscymnoids, Eupritomicris, these are all the Delacids, so the kite fin shark family, um, and they're all either luminous or expected to be luminous because they have those photophores, which is super cool. So that's one branch of the glowing light up shark families. Again, it's really cool to see that cookie cutter sharks light up. Um, like that's that's a pretty cool thing. Then you go into this other branch. Here we've got somniosis. So like the big sharks, like the Greenland shark, uh, the Pacific sleeper, and I forget what, what Restratus is, but these do not line up. But then you have Zamius, which does light up. And then you have Centroscymnus, Cilolepis, that's the Portuguese dogfish, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Scymodon, Oxynotus, uh, Oxynotidae. Most of these don't line up, or don't light up, but they're they're nested within the first ancestor of bioluminescence. They're nested within the light up shark category, but um, Oxynotidae um, don't light up. Somniosidae, there's only one shark, Zamius, that lights up, but the others don't. And then finally, you've got this nice big block, and this is the family Emopteridae, and all of these sharks, including Emopteris virens, um, light up or are presumed to light up because they have um, those photophores. So it's 52 species total in Emopteridae, and they're all presumed to have that ability, that power, to light up in the ocean, which is super cool. And then if you add up these species total let's see because i'm gonna i'm gonna count the dark gray as far as like if you if you observe these photophores are on the body i'm just gonna count that as like oh these probably light up um 40 uh, 43 plus 9 that's 52 53 63 so so far 63 sharks have the ability to bioluminesce. 63 sharks, so far, to our knowledge, have the ability to glow in the dark, uh, which is super, super cool. Um, and I love these... I love how they made these, like, little blue marks, um, where these are the these are the sharks that... Although, like, the gray marks indicate that these sharks probably do light up, the blue marks indicate, like, oh my gosh, we've seen these sharks light up. We've seen this. We've observed um, the colors that they produce. So, we've got some of the famous lantern sharks, like Emopteris granulosus, Emopteris spinax. We have our green lantern shark, Emopteris virens, right there. Uh, Splendidus, Bigeloi, Pusillus, Lucifer, Maleri. Trigononathus kibii, this is the viper dogfish, that lights up, which is really cool. Zamius, Delacius lica, the classic kite fin shark. Um, Assisteus brasiliensis is the classic cookie cutter shark. Euprotomicrid, squaliosis, and Euprotomicris bispinatus. That's so cool that we've seen these light up. So I love this. I love this phylogenetic tree. It's really cool to see the root of uh, bioluminescence in these um, squaliform sharks. And it's really cool to see that the root is definitely deeply nested within um, squall forms in general. So that kind of is a cool thing that makes squall forms unique among sharks, uh, where no other sharks do this. No other sharks have bioluminescence. It's something nested within the squall forms. So lambiforms, carcharinoforms, or lactoloviforms, they don't do it. You know, but squall forms do it. Uh, or some squall forms do it. So it's a pretty cool club. I, I think it's pretty amazing. And this, okay, we definitely have seen this before, but I mean... It's always fun to revisit. Here are the sharks that light up and what they look like. All right. And what I love... There we go. That's a good view. Um, right? Yeah. Okay. That's a good view. Okay. 
what I love is that they have the blue area where it's like we've observed this illuminate and then the gray area where it's like this this probably lights up we have not observed it but it probably lights up so um, but it's kind of cool to see such a difference and it's cool to see these photos in life right here too look at these um, so some of these sharks have full body glow so Delacius the kite fin shark full body glow um, Isistius the cookie cutter shark has that unique collar pattern. This is also why it's called the cigar shark, um, where it's like that dark bar with the blue body. Mosquama is a pocket shark. Euprotomicris lights up all the way. Ah, oh, that's a cool picture of Trigonanathus with those viper jaws, the viper dogfish. And then down here, we've got um, Emopterus. We don't have ours, though. I don't see our shark. We have the other Amopterus, but I don't, I don't see Amopterus virin, sadly. So, uh, but we have, do I have this right? Yeah. Okay. So, Amopterus lucifer, Amopterus pusillus, Amopterus spinax, Amopterus gracilis spinus. Gotcha. What's kind of cool though is like, um, one observation here, though, is you can see that each of the Amopterus has something similar to our Green Lantern Shark as far as, like, that dark bar kind of coming up into the body, but it's not the same pattern. Ours looks more like a nice, clean scythe or, like, a claw, and these, these don't really have the same shape, like, behind the pelvic fins. So it's kind of cool to see that, like, this is part of what Bigelow and Schroeder were saying, that... Amopterus virens is a very unique color pattern. So, oh man, this is so cool. It's not our species, but it's still beautiful to see this. And these are fantastic images. Like, bioluminescence is just beautiful. So, so cool. Also, this is fun. Sorry, sorry about the fuzzy audio, guys. Um, I really appreciate the comment about the music, though. Uh, <laughs> like, um, I, lo I love, like, video game music because it's fun, but it's also, it's meant to be engaging without, like, distracting. Like, it's meant to be something that complements you doing an activity. So, um, I really appreciate that you guys appreciate it. Um, it's, it's pretty fun to have in the background. Uh, Minjus, I love your comment. I had no clue. Um, yeah, it's just, light up sharks are just... Like, or like bioluminescent sharks are just so beautiful and I love this picture it's like there's just such beauty in this like 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 each of these photo forms like they're it's almost like you know like a star field like they're just they're just so so tiny but then when they all work together you have this like beautiful 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 bright blue it's so cool so we'll kind of keep scrolling through it because this study is amazing. And you have different functions right here. So uh, blue is function demonstrated. Um, this uh, gray color, purple color is experimental support. And then uh, white is hypothesis. So we've got camouflage is the biggest function that you know seems to be what's going on. You have smoke screen which is kind of cool. Um, that makes sense. Um, Molly Squama, the pocket shark, the one that I used to, you know, kind of be a little freaked out by, but, you know, now we're cool. Um, one of the things about Molly Squama is that it emits light up, like, like bioluminescent uh, fluid from its, the uh, pocket, like the orifice on the body. And um, it's cool that, like, one theory for that is smoke screen, another is mating. Um, what is this? Aposematism? I've never heard of that. I'm gonna look that up. I have no idea what that is. Aposematism is the use of warning coloration to inform potential predators of the animals poisonous, venomous, or otherwise dangerous. Oh! Interesting. So, the only observance of aposematism uh, Aposematism is in Emopterus, so the lantern sharks. 
So that's actually really cool. And it's not just a hypothesis. There's experimental support that like lantern shark bioluminescence might be an indicator to other animals like, hey, don't touch me. I There's something about me that's a little off i we gotta read that we gotta figure you know what let's i i'm gonna come back to this figure but what in the world the last luminescence function for which experimental support is available is the aposematism a me apose aposematism a mechanism by which an animal advertises potential predators that it is not worth attacking or eating Emopterid sharks, contrary to delation and somniosis species, have large, sharp, defensive spines associated with their dorsal fins. In some species, photophores either placed on the edge of the dorsal fin or around the base of the spines allow these spines to be seen in the dark from a distance by potential predators, and hence potentially work as an aposematic signal as strongly suggested by experimental data. That is so cool! Oh my gosh! That is so cool. So like, that's a, wow. That is so cool. And you can actually, let's zoom in on the figure too. Cause you can actually see that in the figure. Hold on. Right there. All right, check it out. So look at the blue streak on the dorsal fins. So the blue streak is right behind the sharp spines on, on these sharks. Um, the viper dogfish, even though it has fin spines, it doesn't have bioluminescence behind its spines. But lantern sharks um, does have bioluminescence behind the spines. So it supports this idea that um, it is, it's a way to illuminate the spines in the dark and advertise like, do not touch me, do not eat me, I will stab you if you do this. That is so cool. Oh my god, I love sharks. I had no idea that this was a thing. I've never heard of that before. It was so, so cool. Alright. Also, it's fun to see, like, um, lantern sharks, they're kind of like, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's like the the superlative as far as, like, um, we have so many de demonstrated functions of bioluminescence with them. So, definitely, it is for camouflage. Um, definitely it is for recognition. So lantern sharks use their bioluminescence to recognize one another and camouflage themselves from um, predators. But there's experimental evidence that it's used for aposematism. So advertising to animals that, hey, I'm not edible, don't eat me. Um, but also experimental evidence that is used for mating. And then there is a hypothesis that it could be used for vision aid, but we haven't seen that yet. So that is unbelievably cool and I, I i love it this is so so cool man oh man just i love this comment it's like pointing directly at its weapons that is so cool yeah i i agree oh my gosh love lantern sharks this is so so cool uh let's see um just kind of reading some of the comments da -da 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 -da. oh that's sorry those are figure comments um Let's see. It's funny. Oh, here we go. Look at this. Okay. Okay. Amatris virens. Uh, photogenic structure. Photophores. Luminescence color wavelength peak is green. Um, which makes sense. It's called the green lantern shark. But this is the first time we've seen this actually be part of the description. Where it's like most lantern sharks have blue luminescent color. But like, uh, Enzamius has blue-green, Amopteris spinex is blue-green, but Amopteris virens is green. Interesting. Amopteris uh, pusillus is whitish. And then the cookie cutter shark, Squaliolus, um, these are dark blue. Uh, that's actually really cool. That makes our species uh, unique amongst lantern sharks. Okay. These are more of like the actual cells. Um, since we're getting a little late, I don't want to dwell a lot on this. And it's funny, like, uh, we'll probably be back with this paper again. And I forget, because we did the pocket shark and we did the cookie cutter shark. And I forget the first time we saw this paper before. But still, it's very welcome to come back. Delacia Day, Mopter Day. It's cool to see that here are the scales in relation to the photophores. We can take a closer look at this. 
Uh, Somnios today, the sleeper sharks have like kind of classic overlapping dermal denticles, but they have the lights kind of beneath them. Um, the Delacia day, the kite fin sharks, simple leaf shape dermal denticles with the lights in between. But then the lantern sharks and kite fin sharks, Delacia day, Emoptera day. This is kind of cool. Pavement-like dermal denticles. These are actually very unique, and they make the um, bioluminescent spot or photophores uh, more prominent. That's really beautiful. Um, this is this particular skin sample is a, co a cookie cutter shark, but it's cool to see that the family, the lantern shark family, has this. Um, wow. Um, other scale patterns. So of the uh, lantern sharks. You have cross-shaped scales, hook-shaped scales, bristle-shaped scales. But what's cool is that they don't overlap or hide the photophores. They're kind of like the photophores are in between um, the dermal denticles so that they are prominent. Like they don't like like they're not blocked by the actual dermal denticles. That's really cool. Um, this is protein stuff or like molecular stuff that I don't really think we have time for. But this is publicly available, this paper um, you can access on uh, sharkreferences.com. Again, it's called Glow on Sharks, State of the Art on Bioluminescent Research. It's very, very cool. Um, and let's just look up Virens. Just want to see any comments on the Green Lantern Shark. Let's see. This is part of the list, part of the list. Yeah, they don't have a lot on the Green Lantern Shark specifically, which is quite sad. Um, let's just look at, at Mopteris the genus. Um, and we'll just kind of pull up observations in general. So this is really cool. Um, Although observations of shark luminescence have been reported for almost two centuries, that's really cool, the first research projects dedicated to shark luminescence were only initiated in 2005 and focused on a study of the ecological functions and physiological control of the photophores of a single species, the velvet belly lantern shark, Amopteris spinax. Since then, shark luminescence research has flourished with detailed phylogenetic, phylogenetical, ecological, histological, and physiological studies now available for numerous species. That's cool. Mattress, Mattress, Mattress. We'll skip the actual names. Oops. I just want to kind of skip through to see if there's anything about. Okay. The tail of Kyphon sharks, um, Viper dogfish, and lantern sharks which is more mobile and brighter than the rest of the ventral surface area could work as a distracting lure and hence be ana analogous to the caudal photophores of mycophid and tube shoulder fishes. Interesting. Translucent upper eyelid found in homopterid sharks probably, probably play a role in counter illuminating that is facilitating uh, precipitation of downwind light intensity to ensure the perfect match, similarly to what is recently shown for deep sea body fishes. Very cool. From primary function to camouflage, shark bioluminescent patterns progressively became an intra interspecific communication tool and derived amopterid sharks. For example, a mantra species, an ex, an ex, exaptation that considerably increased their speciation rate and has probably been facilitated by the increased size and complexity of mopterid photophores, which allows, allows better orientation to light output, tangential to body surface. So that's interesting. If I'm reading that correctly, that means that um, for lantern sharks, uh, their bioluminescent patterns are increasingly used as a way to communicate with one another, resulting in groups of lantern sharks speciating um, or becoming new species because um, 
Kind of reminds me of Fireflies, where it's like certain groups communicate to each other to mate at the right time. Um, so as time went on, as evolution progressed, um, different and more complicated patterns amongst lantern sharks resulted in maybe the photophores are actually being used to talk to each other or communicate to each other. Um, and in so doing, you kind of create more, like, more, like more of a need to make more and more complex patterns and, you know, more and more species. It's, this is so cool. And those are just references. So, ma'am. Read that again. From a primary function of camouflage, co-opted from the hormonally controlled crypsis mechanism, shallow water lazarbrinks, in Delacia Day, Somniosa Day, and Basal Amopter Day, shark bioluminescent patterns progressively became an intra and interspecific communication tool in derived Amopter sharks, for example, Amopter species, in acceptation that it considerably increased their speciation rate and has probably been facilitated by the increase in size and complexity of Amopter photophores, which allows better orientation of light output. For that is tangential to the body surface. So it's like, it's saying kite fin sharks, sleeper sharks, and other family, or other kinds of sharks in the lantern shark family have like a basic bioluminescent structure. And then Amopterus, like our lantern shark, is more complicated. Ah, so cool. So I could probably read this forever, but it is getting really late. It's getting close to 11. So I think I might wrap up in a little bit. I do want to get back to, um, just that super cool chart earlier, just to have a nice visual for the end. Um, that's really cool. Okay, I wanna make sure we got the lantern shark in there. Perfect, I think that's a good, I think it's a good visual to end on. So, oh my gosh, guys, that's so, so cool. So, um, ma'am. <laughs> Oh, I just saw your comment, Minjus. Yeah, I never uh, saw the thing where the green comes from. Same here, same here. Um, and it wasn't really immediately evident. And even in the species summary profiles, um, they didn't mention it. Like ICM red list or fish base, they did not mention why the green lantern shark is called the green lantern shark. Um, it's not a very well-known species. It's not as famous as Imopter spinax um, or Gracilis spinus or Hylianus. But still, um, it's really cool to see that it has a unique pattern um, it was described uh, because of its unique pattern, and I love that in this study we kind of confirmed that, like, oh my gosh, it has a green color, which is so far unique amongst the lantern sharks. So it's aptly named as the green lantern shark. It's pretty cool um, as far as, like, just having that unique niche in the shark world, and I just love it. So super, super cool. But thank you guys so much for watching. It was awesome to be with you tonight and to explore these lantern sharks together and just to kind of like, this is a fun discussion. We went through a lot of different um, paths and a lot of different like uh, rabbit holes, but that's what it's all about. It's a shark study party where we can kind of talk about whatever we want and um, just explore all kinds of things related to sharks together. So this was a super cool night. Um, I had a lot of fun about the green or with the green lantern shark with you guys. So. Um, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for joining and for tuning in and for like having such a great comment section. Um, it's great to like, you know, not only interact, but also to see you guys like just, you know, talk to each other and just like, it's a great community. So, um, you know, love having you guys here, but I hope you have a great week. I'm really excited for the ba uh, barbled hound shark and I will uh, keep you posted on the uh, fossil project. So uh, we're going to set something up uh, really cool to spring. Hoping to get a collaborator on that. Um, I'm starting to talk in a little bit and figuring out what we do as far as that goes. But uh, stay tuned and I will uh, send updates as I can. Um, because we've got kind of a cool show uh, you know, in the works. So, But have a great week guys. And I'll see you next week. And uh, take care. So have a good one. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Bye.